Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Una Cadigan. I'm a faculty member in the history department at UD. I'm very pleased to be here this morning. I'm very interested in this project. Um, one of my main focuses as a teacher and scholar is interdisciplinary work, and I'm always delighted when interdisciplinary work takes place on such a crucial topic that can't be anything other than interdisciplinary. And we have the most interdisciplinary of panels now this morning in the work of Dr. Bob Brecka and Dr. Douglas Christie. I'll introduce Dr. Christie first, who's joining us via video link. He'll give his presentation, then I'll introduce Dr. Brecka, and then we'll have, I think, ample time for discussion after that. It will be necessary for anyone who wants to ask a question to come to a mic. Um, if we can rig it, we'll have one of these mics in the audience. If not, we might have to ask you to come up here um, for sharing purposes, but I'm sure you can manage that. So, Dr. Douglas Christie is professor of theological studies at Loyola Marymount University. He earned his doctoral degree in Christian spirituality at the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley. And he's the author of The Word in the Desert, Scripture and the Quest for Early Christian Monasticism, published by Oxford, and The Blue Sapphire of the Mind, Note for a Contemplative Ecology, also published by Oxford. He serves as an editor for the journal Spiritus and is the co-director of the Casa de la Mateada program in Cordoba, Argentina. And I ask you to join me in welcoming him this morning on the topic of becoming painfully aware, spirituality and solidarity in Laudato Si. Good morning, Dr. Christie. So uh, first of all, my uh, deep appreciation to Vincent Miller for inviting me and for accommodating this um, rather unusual setup. I'm sorry, I, I um, have been watching a little election coverage lately, so I, I feel like this is maybe my one chance to be a, a talking head on a video uh, speaking to all of you about this important topic. But um, I am very grateful to be included. It's a topic very, very close to my heart, uh, something I've been thinking about for a long time, and I'm have been moved and inspired by reading Laudato Si. And, um, and so I just want to express that to, to all of you, my appreciation for being able to be with you even in this um, somewhat uh, uh, unusual manner. Um, I just want to say something very brief and then I'm going to move into this uh, PowerPoint that I prepared. Um, Vincent asked me to comment on the spirituality of Laudato Si. And um, I was very grateful for the invitation because it, it um, gave me the chance to walk through the document uh, very, very carefully and look at it closely. And it won't come as a surprise to any of you there to uh, realize how deeply a spirituality informs almost every page of this document. Um, what we even mean by spirituality, of course, is one of the questions that we need to consider today and one of the questions that I think we're considering. There has been, in the Catholic tradition, certainly um, tendencies um, to think of spirituality as uh, quite um, individual, quite um, focused on the interior life, is what we often call it. Um, uh, quite removed from the world, all things which wouldn't make spirituality a very promising partner for thinking about how to respond to climate change. Uh, similarly, we all know that there have been long and difficult and contentious debates between a, a worldview that we broadly call scientific and one which takes seriously the presence of the divine uh, in our world, in our lives, and uh, that also would seem to be not very promising as a starting point for thinking about uh, how to take climate change seriously as a spiritual question. So much has changed, however, in the last uh, 25 to 30 years, and I would simply point to one uh, kind of 
uh, change that I think has been uh, hugely significant, and that is the way that those who write about and think about the natural world, I'm thinking about uh, um, Thoreau's many descendants, uh, nature writers, natural history writers, uh, ecologists, biologists who I've had contact with over the years, they're, um, you're, you're beginning to see something quite uh, remarkable, I think. The, the natural curiosity and interest in the, in the particulars of the living world are, are also uh, leading to a kind of an openness to what sometimes has to be simply named as mystery because the question of God is too complicated, but it's there. There's an openness. There's a, a sense of possibility of a rapprochement between uh, two worlds, if you will. So anyway, I think it's a very promising moment for us to be thinking about this all together. So um, without further ado, I'm going to jump into this, um, into this PowerPoint if it will allow me. And um, and you'll have to tell me whether you can see that. Yes, we can see it. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> I um, I'm going to offer maybe. 10 minutes worth of comments. I don't think I'll get through all of this, but I'm focusing my comments on the notion of awareness in the document. It ends up being quite critical to almost everything that Pope Francis has to say about the environment and our response to it. And one of the most um, astonishing things is his, um, his invitation to, to us to completely change the way we see. And there are other uh, voices in this conversation, including the poet who you're seeing here, Rilke, who also invite this new way of seeing. Um, of course, the great Aldo Leopold, who uh, in the midst of his deeply informed scientific work also um, raised the questions of what kind of ethical response we might be able to form uh, if we to the natural world if we're not also involved uh, opening ourselves in love, making ourselves vulnerable to the world. So uh, Francis is in very good company, I think, in raising this issue. And His this statement in the opening part of the document uh, is to me one of the most important, uh, I think, observations in the entire, uh, in the entire encyclical. Dr. Christie? I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, we're only seeing your title slide. Would you like to stop and see if we can fix the technology, or would you prefer to keep going? Yes. So, so no, we, can, we can stop, or I can also just, um, yes, let me, let me see what we can do here. Did he put it in, did he put it in slide mode, uh, play the slideshow mode? OK, so. Um, now we see the slide that begins with our goal is to become painfully aware. Yes. But it's still, it's still not in slideshow mode on our end. Yes. Um, well, what if we were to proceed this way? It's not as, uh, it's not as pretty, but it's, it's maybe more effective, and I can move through it. Sure. That's fine, yes. OK. So, um, I'm drawing attention to this statement at the beginning of the encyclical because I think it's one of Pope Francis' most important uh, exhortations to all of us in the human family. And this notion of what it means to become painfully aware, I think, is critical to the entire document and to its moral and spiritual um, call to us to transform how we see the world, how we live in the world. It, <laughs> It invites a complete, uh, wholehearted involvement in this task. I think it's, it's critical to understanding what. So, if I simply uh, point that out as a way of um, uh, noting. I think what I think is is it's important. There is a. Can you see that? Yes. Second slide. Yes. Yes, okay. There is a there is kind of a, um, a bookend to this call to practice 
painful awareness that comes much later in the document. And it, it is, um, it is Francis's um, very beautiful, I think, uh, uh, invitation to practice also a loving awareness that allows us to understand who we are in the natural world and our deep connection with every other living being. This loving awareness, he of course uh, uh, relates to uh, the idea that we are part of a splendid universal communion. So painful awareness and loving awareness, this is what I'm uh, essentially uh, putting before you this morning. And what I, what I also want to suggest that uh, this is a, this can be understood as a contemplative orientation to the world. <clears throat> the contemplative traditions that I have studied for, <clears throat> for many, many years now um, place a great deal of value on the, the possibility of clarifying or deepening our awareness of who we are in God, who we are in relation to ourselves, and who we are in relation to all of reality. So the notion that, that awareness can be transformed or deepened or changed, opened out to include a uh, more intimate relationship with everything and everyone, that's critical to the Christian contemplative tradition. And I think it's also reflected in Francis's own approach. So I'm, I'm also wanting to suggest today that the encyclical can be usefully read as uh, as a further uh, commentary or expression of this uh, ancient Christian contemplative tradition. And let me see if I can. Um... So I'm, I'm going to make just a couple more comments uh, about what, what I think would just be kind of obvious from reading the document, but it's worth pointing out since my invitation has been to address the questions of spirituality. Um, uh, and at several points during the document, Francis makes very clear that spirituality is critical to everything that he's trying to do. And this statement that uh, from uh, section 2.16 is, is reflective of this. Um, He's pointing to this idea, I think, that we, we have ideas, we have concepts, we have doctrines, and unless they are informed by something deep within us, our own sense of involvement and commitment to a feeling for the world, uh, it, it won't be enough to sustain our work. So he's pointing clearly to the importance of spirituality as, um, as something that must be included in our, uh, in our work. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an add-on, it's not something that we, we kind of get to later once we've solved all the big public policy or other ethical or economic uh, concerns relating to climate change. It's got to be there at the beginning, it's got to be there at every stage. Um, and it's also, I think, very critical that the document points to and insists upon the communal dimension of our own spiritual practice. In the United States, I think it's, it's <laughs> worth noting, even if it's quite obvious, we have a, a, a long culture of individualism that sometimes expresses itself as um, in, in very positive ways and creative ways, but oftentimes leaves us isolated, unable to even imagine what a community would look like. Francis works against that throughout the document to, uh, to invite us to consider that whatever uh, ecological conversion is going to mean, it's going to have to be communal. So I'm also wanting to suggest that the ethos of the document includes these three things, attention, presence, and responsibility. And I believe Laudato Si beautifully connects these three in one single vision of spiritual thought and practice. And attention 
uh, in the way that I'm using it here, harkens back to the earliest uh, Christian spiritual tradition or, or uh, one of the earliest expressions of it in the late third, early fourth century, prosoche, the, the way that um, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers used it, and then the way people like uh, Clement of Alexandria and Evagrius of Pontus and others used it. It's this deep, deep, deep attention to the real. And, uh, and this attention, then, the practice of attention begins to make possible a greater sense of presence to that reality. We feel the presence of reality, and we ourselves are present to reality. And at least in the way that the document understands it, and I think at its best, the Christian spiritual tradition always includes a sense of responsibility for others, uh, other human beings, other living beings arising out of this uh, deep sense of, of presence. So I'm suggesting that Laudato Si presents us with a holistic vision of awareness and solidarity. Solidarity is a word that we have in our vocabulary that helps us express the deepest kind of responsibility that we're aiming for. And I think the document uh, over and over again uh, insists that whatever new awareness we're coming to, it has to be bound to a deepening sense of solidarity, especially with uh, those who are being uh, affected most severely by climate change, the poor and the marginalized. So um, I'm trying to keep track of the time here. I'm close to the end of my time. He's fine. No, he's no. You're fine. Yeah. Oh. Um, so uh, Laudato Si is not a, an encyclical for the faint of heart. Um, the, the critique of our current situation uh, is quite severe in some respects and quite, um, and quite strong. And, um, and this statement, I think, captures at least some part of what Pope Francis is wanting to call, us, uh, call to our attention, um, our lack of awareness of who we are. And, and so if the positive vision of awareness that he's putting before us is an invitation to become more present and alive to the world and to one another, to the suffering that we encounter in the world. He's also trying to ask us to consider why we are, have become so unaware, why our awareness has faltered of who we are in the world, um, what our responsibility is to one another. So he critiques this quite strongly and, uh, and it has many different uh, expressions, including our, our deep addiction to consumer culture, um, our, a, a kind of an addiction to speed that it, it, it everyone feels in the world that, that prevents us actually from being more reflective about who we are in the world. On the other hand, he makes very clear that we also already possess the awareness that we need. And this is quite, um, I think, one of the beautiful things about the document. Um, uh, Francis it has, has no hesitation in pointing out our, 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 our kind of um, enslavement, certain ideologies and certain habits of thought and practices. But he also, and I think this is very much in keeping with the best of our Christian spiritual tradition, he points out that we already have all that we need to make our way forward. We already possess the awareness in our faith, in the, the in our in our, in our uh, embrace of the Paschal mystery, in our in our in our capacity to enter into the of Easter. Everything we need is already with us, in us, personally as well as in the community as a whole. So we lack awareness, but we also it's already there uh, before us. Um, so a couple more comments about the critiques that he makes. Uh, the, the, the word superficial ecology is, is brought to bear, which I think is very interesting and very helpful. He uses the word ecology, which has a very positive meaning for Francis, but also asks us to notice 
how thin our own ecology is. And by ecology here, I think he means a larger sense of connection uh, uh, among and between different realities, not just living beings, but our own moral relationship with them. And, he, and he's noting that it, the superficiality leaves us, uh, leads us to this complacency and, and recklessness. So um, that's also an important part of the critique that he makes. And of course, he does propose an alternative vision that's much more robust and much deeper and more beautiful and ultimately more sustainable. Um, and, a, and another thing, I know this is going to be taken up later in the conference, but if, you, if we want to speak about uh, an integral ecology, it's not only our relationship with every other living being, it's our deep uh, relationship with the poor and the dispossessed. And one of the great achievements of the encyclical, from my perspective, is Francis's unwillingness to let these uh, become uh, disconnected from one another. Our attention to the natural world and our attention to uh, the poor and the suffering human beings in our midst. So he, he is very strong on this. And in various places in the encyclical, he insists on this. And I believe, again, this can be seen not just as, a, as an ethical call, but as a deep spiritual uh, reality that he's calling us into. Um, this is kind of, uh, you might say, uh, anti-contemplative practice. And I find it very interesting, his language here. He says, we're trying not to see. We, we, we've invested ourselves deeply in trying not to see certain things. And so if contemplative practice in its deepest sense is about opening our eyes and learning to see, which has a, a profound moral meaning, then we've got to pay attention to what we're unwilling or unable to see. And he calls us out on that. Um, and of course, again, he, 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 he loops back to this uh, sense of um, the change that we need will have to be uh, borne out by what we've always known as metanoia, which is a deep change in our mind and our way of thinking and seeing reality. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of close this up now because I think I, I have used up my time, but um, I wanna note just something that I, to me is really quite beautiful about the encyclical. He calls us toward the end of the encyclical to a way of living that is almost unimaginable in our, in our uh, speeded up, uh, consumer-oriented world. Uh, there's a larger movement afoot in our world right now, slow living, slow food, slow, slowing down almost everything as a way of reclaiming our humanity and our way of living in the world. Francis uh, believes that this is critical. And he also believes, I, I think he shows this, that this sense of slowing down and opening up our consciousness to reality is going to be what will enable us to be serene present, he says, to each reality. And this notion of serene presence is very compelling to me and I think is worth our attention. Um, so uh, anyway, I think um, I'll, I'll move to the end here. Toward the end, he's just simply saying this life of greater simplicity, greater slowness, greater attention, it's not a lesser life. It is not a lesser life. It is, it, it, we would say it's gospel living. It's life to, to the full. Um, and finally, there's, there's this kind of wonderful note toward the end of the document of appreciation and enjoyment. What are we called to? We're called to rekindle, reawaken in ourselves our capacity to appreciate and enjoy existence. Not a small thing. Not a small thing. So we're called in the end to practice an awareness that is also a way of practicing solidarity and just standing with every other living being, all of our fellow human beings, deeply connected to one another and committed to a common reality. And in that sense, returning to my opening comments, I simply want to observe that for Pope Francis and the encyclical, 
painful awareness and loving awareness are one. And this is the kind of transformed awareness we're being called into that he believes will help inform an ethic of deep engagement and responsibility for the living world and one another. <coughs> Thank you very much.